calendar. But it is time for Shiny Side Out with Dave and Mecky. So I hope you have your tinfoil hat all made and cinched down tight over your ears. So take it away, Dave and Mecky. Welcome to Shiny well, Side Out with Dave and Mecky, though I can't get in touch with him today. I think he's still in the air flying to the good U.S. of A. Part of his work. He has to do that. Must be terrible. He hates it. I love it. I just wish I was doing that. Anyway, we're on WZZR, broadcasting from Australia from Revolution Radio, which is Freedom Slips. Dot com, where it's more than just radio, so jump in the chat room if you can. This is show number, now let me remember, 200 and, what is it, 269, yeah, <sighs> crazy, isn't it? It's on air, online, and on your smart device, so grab an app to listen anywhere, or listen at home on a Grace Tabletop digital radio. If you missed Solaris's show... Now, she told me who she had on today, and I was actually listening to it. I thought it was awesome, as are all her shows, by the way. Let me have a look. She says she had Mary, oh, I'm not going to pronounce this very well, but uh, Monoz, Monoz, and Hannah Theresen. And they were talking about their new book, Signatures of, of, sorry, Signatures of an Abductee. Actually resonated with me, the whole thing. Good on you ladies, and if only I was in the US, I'd be able to also enjoy their conferences. And, but I'm not, so sadly not. One day though, they may come to Australia, I'd love to talk to them about their experiences on my show, and in person maybe even. Uh, you know what? Not like me, but if you missed it, if you just catch our show, or if you get our show in the archives, and you don't know who I am, Oh, sorry, you don't know who Solaris is. <laughs> Solaris means sun. But if you don't know who Solaris is, then you need to get access to the archives. What you need to do is pay $5 a month, which is only like the cost of a cup of coffee. That's all it takes, $5 a month. And you can get access to all of the host shows on freedomslips.com. The archive. You can check out her shows, our shows, everybody's shows. I actually do it, even though the station owner, Nighthawk, said, you know, you don't have to do it. You know, you supply your time to give us content in the archive. I said, yeah, I know. I said, but I, I want access to the archives so I can have a look at other people's shows. Because, you know, my life's hectic. It's always, it's, it's, it's just hectic. I'm busy doing this, doing that. Never get time to even do anything except for this show. I get time for this. I make time for this. All the other thing is basically just reacting to what's going on around me. Never have a plan. Always have an idea of what I want to do. And maybe I'll cross off something in the week. Next week, I'll just refer to the list. It's grown again. <laughs> anyway, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I live, where I'm sitting right now. And they are named the Dark and Yule people and I pay respect to their elders past present and future very important I say that we didn't do it for a long time I used to do it at work where I was you know we'd have a meeting and any meeting had to be preceded with the acknowledgement of the traditional owners and stating their title who they were the dark new people where I live this was sort of like a it's like a rest stop on a highway for people traveling and before white fellas before white people came to australia this poor part of the the coastline was visited by many not just neighboring but even distant um cultures within australia and they, they would walk down here and visit sydney and uh, along the way they would stop for a while chat and uh, so this area adopted quite a a high multi multilingual uh, environment which is really interesting and one of those words was ra for sun think about that for a minute there's a history in that look there's my intro gone and i, I wanted to bring something up and what today's topic that's right today today's topic is planet x 
the planets, how they're discovered. When you walk away from today, having listened to this show, you'll know all about planets. You won't need to know anything else. Simple as. Okay, done. Next, the the thing I wanted to bring up today was, and it's like a little fun factoid, but I'm not sure if it's that much fun. It's certainly a factoid. And it is, I'll, 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 I'll tell you why I'm telling you about this. Firstly, North Korea rhetoric is gone. The 24-hour news cycle in my country, certainly, is now all about our upcoming budget announcement and schools getting less funding. That's it. No one cares. No one cares about anything else. Oh, schools. Yeah, schools. Yeah, that's really important. Let's talk about that for a while. Why was it all North Korea? We didn't have pretty much any rhetoric coming from King Jong Un himself, did we? Did we? You just see, you saw no, no media with his face on it talking with a date and a translator accurately translating his his speech. Nothing. That's pretty much it. So where's the aggression aggression coming from? Who knows? Does the earth feel just a little bit more peaceful today? Yeah, it does. How can it feel peaceful all the time? Some of you might ask, and guess what? It's easy. Turn off your TV. Where every day is the same. The, every day is just you. And the weather. And your uh, the, the excellent interaction you have with your fellow human. Because I think you'll find if you talk to your neighbor nicely and you get on, you create a good rapport with them, that you'll have the beginnings of a community. And that community will get you out of trouble, I'll tell you. If, if the S hits the F, that's where you start. You don't want to have this uh, long-standing battle with your neighbor who, well, you know, maybe you, you could still outgrow that animosity because you'd have a common enemy. That would be hunger and no power. And, <laughs> and then shortly afterwards, no alcohol. And then, you know, blisters on your hands from having to do all the work. Wow. Okay, so putting that aside, because of there not being very much news in the news cycle that's worthy of mentioning, because I really don't care about schools and the funding. I got kids there, they're going to school. But the arguments in this country were all about, you know, the, uh, the loss of funding to private schools of between one and three dollars per year per student. And they're up in arms. Oh my God, that's the end of our funding. We'll have to shut the school down. What, because like $3,000? Big deal. You're charging the parents $30,000 a year per student to put your kids in school. And you should see some of the facilities at these schools. I mean, I went to a state-run school. Nothing wrong with that. I came out the other side. As you would expect, I became a a working member of the community, a working member of society, and a working member inside an organization of many of that I've worked at, and I think I do a reasonable job. That's all we need, isn't it? Is that what we need? What do we, what do we expect from these kids who aren't going to be going to careers anymore? And you know, I do have an opinion, but when you hear, you know, they cry poor, the, you know, whether it's a um, a Catholic run school or it's just a, a private school altogether without a religion base you have to consider why they're crying poor I mean they've got better facilities than I've ever seen you know they have stadiums like like professional footballers they have it's a stage with audio and video gear better than the paid place you visit to see plays next door better films you know film media productions than television stations 
Where are they getting this money from? Well, it's not from the government. The government's just giving them the basic thing that everyone else gets just because they cried poor before. So anyway, it's just, it's hilarious to hear them crying poor when they've got better facilities than anywhere else. In fact, if they didn't spend all that money on all the stuff they had, those kids would have, you know, be just coated in gold. Wouldn't they? They'd probably have money fights. The kids who wouldn't be, you know, rugby and tennis and all the things they play. It would be, you know, how to burn money quicker. Yeah, let's try that. We've got too much of it. Yeah, anyway. So that, that's my rant. I'll let that go. So because of that being, you know, there's no really urgent you know, global news that's going to kill us. I found this news story, and I think this is really interesting. It became came, comes from the, the mainstream media about what can kill us. And the headline is, there are diseases hidden in the ice, and they are waking up. It says long dormant bacteria and viruses trapped in ice and permafrost for centuries, it says, are reviving as Earth climate warms. Okay, so Earth's climate is warming and these things are going to become uh, airborne or released into the atmosphere or the environment and we're going to all die. So I, you know, of course I posted this thing because I thought it was interesting. And I said, pandemic, anyone? Is that what we're looking at? Is that what they're calling? They're calling this in advance? You have to think about that. And I always I always put this forward. Okay, so we, we live on Earth, and we've been here for millions of years, apparently. All right, but we're still susceptible to some things that we might come across in the wild. Fair call. We can't cut ourselves because we'll, we could die of infection. Why that's possible, I don't know. You think about dogs and cats, for instance, as species, not the domesticated ones, which are resistant to, say, the funnel web, for instance. Yeah, but we're not. We're not resistant to it at all. Horses resistant to it. So why, why are some of the animals resistant to these things that we're not? That's very strange. So this, their story by Jasmine Fox Skelly, uh, the 4th of May 2017, throughout history humans have existed side by side with bacteria and viruses. True. That's my comment. From the pubonic plague to smallpox, we have evolved to resist them. And in response, they have developed new, new ways of infecting us. Now we have antibiotics for almost a century, ever since Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. That's true as well. In response, bacteria have responded by evolving antibiotic resistance. That's also true. The battle is endless. It's continuous. It's my comments. Because we spend so much time with pathogens, we sometimes develop a kind of natural stalemate. So if we don't touch them, they won't evolve, but they always evolve because we try to stop them. They still evolve anyway. So that's what all of that says. And I thought that was very interesting. And, and my question really is, are they setting us up again? Are they, are they going to unleash them on us intentionally? Or are they just going to stand back and go, ah, oh, couldn't help it. So we saw it coming. We told you it was going to happen. Yeah, not much we can do about it. It seems to be resistant to everything we don't do. So that's why I put that there. They've also got a bunch of pictures here from the permafrost all melting. And yeah, yeah, the Earth's warming. Good luck with us. I also ask, why on Earth would we... You know, what conversation led to having Mars as the secondary new Earth? I state that we've grown up with the viruses on here on earth aren't we just going to die when we go there aren't we going to come in contact with everything and it's foreign to us everything there and we have no natural immunity to it how do we know what's there and indeed that the little bit of rock that they found in the antarctic sitting on the ice which was clearly a meteor which had fallen 
don't know how old, but not that old, not not that long ago, it was old. They said like four billion years old, the rock was or something. And they immediately leapt to it being from Mars. How can you tell if it's been from Mars? We haven't brought anything back from Mars. How can they tell? At the time they made the claim, they hadn't sent anything there to examine the actual nature, the composition of the rocks. How can I make the claim? We all lapped it up. Yeah, that's a Mars rock. That rock's from Mars. They told us it is. How can they know? Unless, of course, you know, Buzz and Neil did go to Mars. They didn't go to the moon and all that moon footage was just there as a, a ruse because they really wanted to go to Mars instead. Maybe that's what the whole thing was all about. Maybe they did bring back Mars rocks. Did you know that the moon rock that was sold, oh, I forget when it was, within the last 10 years, certainly, was fake. And it was faked as a gift to someone and they they wanted to let it go. They didn't mind that they, they either they, they passed away and their estate was being sold. But the actual rock, which was the same, the same rock in the photographs, was fake and it was given to them by NASA. You've got to think about that. So NASA gave someone a fake rock, a fake moon rock. It wasn't even from the moon. That's interesting right there. Anyway, so what I wanted to t tell you, it's a terrible segue, of course it is, but all about planets. And in, in particular, I wanted to start this by saying Planet X. Because Planet X has been mentioned a number of times. I think we can all remember that. And I'll get back to that a bit later on. But Planet X is supposed, supposed to be the 10th the planet. But of course they demoted Pluto, making Planet X Planet 9. So no longer it is is it the is that the uh, the Roman numeral of ten. It's now planet nine. But I'll get into that the demotion of planet uh, uh, Pluto, and what defines a planet. I'll get into one of those in a minute. But just for the minute, right now, the term planet is widely accepted as to have come from the Greek word or for wanderer or planetes or planetos planetos to understand why we need to examine how we discovered planets so there's three different ways of discovering a planet one by observation that's how we did it initially there's through stories as well that was the anunnaki story the sumerians tale of the anunnaki arriving to earth and then we discovered planets through maths, which became a very recent tool of ours, but recent in geologic time. Okay, so today we have simply to look up, and there they are, easily identifiable. You would think, but well, not quite. We have already been taught what they are at school. So take your mind back to a time when we had amnesia, global amnesia, and a post-flood environment when we would have surely had known. We would have known then. Planets are only apparent if you study the sky. Casual, occasional glances do not result in identifying anything. Only random dim bright and very bright points of light some with vastly different colors i've seen red ones bluish ones just white ones blinking ones ones that see, appear to be two very small dots right next to each other they could either be physically next to each other or um, in line with my line of sight and distant apart from each other as long as they appear to be the same it's only through the study of these points of light that anything begins to make sense. The positions of the objects and then in relation to each other. And you begin to notice changes. 
But once you can identify which ones change, you soon discover that there are two sets of objects. A seemingly distant, constant background field of stars and an entirely different set of objects which move around with some certainty in front of that background of stars. I hope I'm being clear here. I'm going to keep, I've managed to go back in the chat room, which is fantastic. Good to see. I hope it, it's all making sense. So if you've got a comment or a question, please don't forget to uh, pop it into the chat room. This is at freedomslips.com. Just go to the chat room there and you can message me while I'm on air, which is really neat. Most of the paths work well enough to plot. This is the, the paths of the planets. As in, they move across the sky uniformly, but sadly, really, that isn't true. Their motions are not uniform. They're not uniform. You have to think about that. While I'm talking, I'm going to pop up a video which uh, on YouTube. The YouTubers will be able to see this one. All right. After the show, it's been on air. I'll pop it up onto YouTube. and You can also get the archives, but you missed the video. So you should subscribe, subscribe to uh, Shiny Side Out on YouTube. All right. Now, so their motions aren't always uniform. Uh, but, but they all have weird movements. Some stop, some stop and go back the other way as well. And then stop again and return in the correct direction. Now I've got a really good example of this and, and one of these such objects is Mars. It travels across the sky, it can double back on itself and then continue on again in the normal manner. This action was later given the name and described as being in retrograde while it's returning and going backwards and then it stops and goes forward again. Mars makes a single zigzag pattern once every two or so years and it is in reverse for a couple of months. Isn't that weird? So strange. So remember when it was discovered the next time around after our amnesia post flood, it was discovered that, uh, that it did this weird zigzag and it's there on, on the YouTube right now. Now that was supposed to be in a time when we believed that the earth was in the middle of everything, because that's the way it would appear. The sun would look like it revolved around us, the moon likewise, everything else around us, of course, that's from an, uh, uh, an egocentric point of view, or a planet-centric point of view. And it gave them a lot of grief. You see, this motion of Mars wasn't easily explainable at the time, because Earth was thought to be in the center of the solar system. And it was found that all the planets have an odd behavior about them. That's because as we go around the sun, we either catch up to them or they are flying away from us because we've gone past them now. And that motion causes them to zigzag. It's awesome. I just think it's great as we go through basically the high point of our curve or the nearest point from them, or even the furthest point from them. So the solar system discovery, and this is, this is great. This is the, the defining time when we realize we're not the center of everything. So it is easy to see how the ghastly mistake of placing the earth at the center of the universe was made. Simply everything rises in the east and sets in the west. We aren't spinning, they thought. So, yeah, we aren't spinning, they thought. They rotate about us, the Earth. The notion that the Earth revolves around the Sun had been proposed as early as the 3rd century BC. And this is um, Aristarchus of Samos in 270 BC. A smart guy, though, he calculated the size of the Earth and measured the size and distance of the Sun and Moon. While his writings are lost in time, though, there is a reference to them in the book by the now famous Archimedes, in his book, The Sand Reckoner, 
And I've got a quote from that book, which is really cool. His hypothesis are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves about the sun on the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the middle of the orbit, and that the sphere of fixed stars situated about the same centre as the sun is so great that the circle in which he supposes the earth to revolve bears such a proportion to the distance of the fixed stars as the centre of the sphere bears to its surface. It's a great quote. I just love that. So basically all he says is, like, like I said in my intro, there's a blanket of stars that out there that don't appear to move all the planets do move and we rotate about the sun on the outside of a circle that's what he says on the circumference but i love the way that they that there's something lost in the english english language that is it was magical in their ability to describe things so you don't have any more questions there's no questions you can ask that isn't already revealed in that phrase so we come to Copernicus and we've mentioned him a number of times and he was born in 1473 and died in 1543 that's 70 years he lived for so he was born into this belief system and saw another way of explaining its workings so mind you I mean this the sand reckoner book by Archimedes was accepted only as fiction it wasn't the belief at the time the belief was that the the earth was still at the center religion was propagating this belief and um, their resistance was was where we go now in the, in the story so Copernicus moved heliocentrism centrism that's a heliocentrism from philosophical speculation to predictive geometrical astronomy this is what he did part of his life was to do this in reality copernicus's system did not predict the planet's position any better than the ptolemaic system this theory re, uh, resolved the issue of planetary retrograde motion by arguing that such motion was only perceived and apparent rather than real it was a parallax effect as an object that is one passing seems to move backwards against the horizon the issue was also resolved in the geocentric triconic system that the latter however while eliminating eliminating the major epicycles retained a physical reality in the irregular back and forth motion of the planets which kepler char characterized as pretzel so when you have to start making names for the reason why you don't understand it's it's what's happening like the and Mackie would love this like the placebo effect then you're making it up naming it and pushing it aside doesn't explain it it just gives it a name and pushes it aside and therefore not fixing anything Copernicus's commentarialus so that's a book summarized his helocentric theory it listed the assumptions upon which the theory was based as follows and number one there is no center of all the celestial circles or spheres number two the center of the earth is not the center of the universe but only of gravity and of the lunar sphere that's the moon's orbit three all the spheres uh, uh, revolve about the sun as their midpoint then therefore the sun is the center of the universe number four the ratio of the earth's distance from the sun to the height of the firmament and i, I wanted to really bring that out today too which is the outermost celestial sphere containing the stars is so much smaller than the ratio of the earth's radius to its distance from the sun that the distance from the earth to the sun is imperceptible in comparison with the height of the firmament now if you don't quite understand that or i said it 
in it really poorly. The stars seem to be so much further away than the sun is from us that if you were the sun measuring the distance to the firmament, basically the earth is on you. It's so close to you. It's basically, let's consider it part of you. It's not, not the same. So he, def he also defined the firmament. Uh, whatever motion appears in the firmament arises not from any motion of the firmament, but from the earth's motion. The earth together with its circumjacent elements performs a complete rotation on its fixed poles in a daily motion. While the firmament and highest heaven abide unchanged. So he's saying the earth is not connected to the firmament. The firmament is out there, which is the background blanket of stars, and the earth rotates daily. What appear to us as motions of the sun arise not from its motion, but from the motion of the earth and our sphere, which, so with which we revolve about the sun like any other planet. The earth has then more than one motion. Now, the last point that he made was the apparent retrograde and direction of motion of the planets arise not from their motion, but from the Earth's. The motion of the Earth alone, therefore, suffices to explain so many apparent inequalities in the heavens, remembering that they had an awful time trying to describe why the planets were doing what they were doing when observed. So he twisted it all about in their minds, not in his, he just made sense of it. However, the other book, which was De Revolutionibus, described was, uh, sorry, it, it's, it was divided into six sections or parts called books. Um, this was his other work, General Vision of the Heliocentric Theory and Summarized Exposition of His Idea in the World. Number two, mainly theoretical, he presented the principles of spherical astrometry, uh, astronomy and a list of stars as a basis for the arguments developed in the subsequent books. Number three, mainly de dedicated to the apparent motions of the sun and to related phenomena. Number four, description of the moon and its orbital motions. Number five, um, exposition of the motions of longitude and the non-terrestrial planets. And lastly, exposition, exposition of the motions of in latitude of the non-terrestrial planets. So both longitude and latitude. Now, with his ideas out there, the world had to cope with there being inner and outer planets. Inner planets are those with orbits inside our own planet Earth and are found nearer to the Sun, and outer planets are all of those planets considered to be further away from the Sun than the Earth. But sadly, despite it sounding so easy to us today, this was a very difficult idea to adopt. Now, it wasn't until Galileo in 1564 he lived from then till 1642 he lived for 78 years now he was a big believer in the heliocentric theory but he was convicted of grave suspicion of heresy for following the position of copernicus now i mean it's crazy right you have to think about this copernicus died in 1543 and here it is, 1564 when he's born, and there's still uh, the resistance against it. 100 years, still resistance. At the instance of Roger Boscovich, the Catholic Church, um, church's 1758 index of prohibited books omitted the general prohibited uh, prohibition of works defending heliocentrism which was 131 if you're looking for that book but retained the specific prohibitions of the original 
uncensored versions of the De Revolutionibus and Galileo's dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. Those prohibition, prohibitions were finally dropped in 1835. Let that sink in. See, we need to understand the position of the church. We are not saying, that's Mackie and I, we're not saying that they are right in what they did. But we think that they were more concerned about what this new information would do to the church and its followers and society. It may have seemed to them that it would be the, an admission that they were wrong and it could have thrown doubt into their into the air about the other information that the Bible held to be true. This could have destroyed the church entirely and led people back to paganism, or worse, in their eyes, remembering the work they had that had gone to gain them by aligning their religious holidays in the past had worked so successfully for the church by pulling pagans across to the, the church. It could have all been ruined. Look, we think the same today in a bunch of things. The mainstream media, governments, NASA, the world leaders about war, UFO, politics, world affairs, you name it. We can cite many examples, but the Brookings report, which covers alien life and what to do have found, suggests not telling anyone because of mass hysteria, societal breakdown, etc. People just not going to work. Today's these thoughts seem ridiculous, don't they? I mean, they really do. Uh, with more people right now believing that they've either been abducted, I think there's 1.3 million insurance company um, agreements signed to those who fear being uh, abducted and taken away. So there's 1.3 million insurance company uh, insurances? I don't know. Uh, not claims, but insurances against abduction. Doesn't that tell you something? I think it does. I think well, the last time I heard it was like 54% of people believe that aliens are real. And more than 70% of people believe that they probably exist anyway and always have done. So, but let's get back to the discovery of planets. Another way to discover planets is by using maths. I know, but don't tune out just now, right? Because this will get interesting, I promise you. Orbit perturbations, or the changes to a planet's orbit, which can be seen as a slowing down or stretching of the orbit away from the sun, just enough to be detectable mathematically. That's what it is. But don't scoff at this. While Uranus was discovered using a weak telescope by today's standards, by William and Caroline Herschel on the 13th of March 1781. I want you to remember that date. That's very important. Let's just call it 1781. All right. Both Neptune and Pluto were discovered only by maths. That's how we found them. Frenchman Urbain Jean uh, jo Joseph Le Verrier. And Englishman John Couch Adams independently predicted the existence of and position of Neptune, which was visually confirmed in 1846. This discovery supported gravitation or Newtonian physics and maths, and maths also predicted the return of Halley's Comet in 1758. It marked a turning point from visual to mathematical astronomical research. That's a Big step forward. Absolutely big step. Mathematical discovery of planets. The first planet to be discovered was Uranus by William and Carol Herschel, as I said, in 1781. 1781, 1781. I want you to, that, that's very important that we remember that date, right? 1781. It was discovered by the fact that it showed a disk when viewed through even a fairly low powered telescope. The only other planets which have been discovered. Are Neptune and Pluto. Okay, so I've got some pictures of auto orbital dynamics in the show notes, which you can download later on. The orbits of the planets are ellipses with the sun at 
one focus of all of the same ellipses obviously gravity wells and space-time with the exception of mercury which is very nearly circular it's the only one that says circular as possible all the rest of your ellipses the orbits of the planets are all more or less in the same plane called the ecliptic which is the sun's equator the spin the spin equator and defined by the plane of the earth's orbit so when we discovered the earth's orbit we looked at the sun and we are equatorial spinning around its equator that became the ecliptic the ecliptic is inclined only seven degrees from the plane of the sun's equator very slightly it's probably something to do with like if you look at motion of things in a blender you'll see that they will rotate slowly about the speed of the blade in the same rotational direction as the speed of the blade but they'll all be collapsing in front of themselves to get down the front to the next bit they don't rotate the in the opposite direction it's very important the above diagram if you get the youtube um shows the relative sizes of the orbits of the eight planets plus pluto from a perspective somewhat above the ecliptic hence their non-circular appearance they all orbit in the same direction counterclockwise looking down from above the sun's north pole all but venus and uranus sorry all but venus uranus and pluto also rotate in that sense all but they do venus is counterclockwise both pluto and uranus rotate lying on their side that's what i meant so venus turns the opposite direction to all the other planets and pluto and uranus are lying on their side 90 degrees from the ecliptic and they rotate that way but we didn't discover this until we had good enough telescopes to watch them remember uranus was discovered in 17 what was it 81 1781 so a planet is a body that orbits the sun this is a definition it's got to be massive enough for its own gravity to make it around well to make it round not around just round so it can't be lumpy to be large enough to be a sphere and another definition is it has to have cleared its neighborhood of smaller objects around its orbit now it's that that's a very it's a crucial point to make as a definition because this is one of the things they wanted to do when they were trying to decrease the stature of pluto and no longer make it a planet you know we've discovered it's got moons not just one it's got more than one so under this new definition pluto and the other trans neptunian uh, neptunian neptunian objects do not qualify as planets neither is jupiter which is a cloud-like formation of junk in its trailing orbit path it hasn't cleared its objects around itself on its orbit do you know the IAU's decision has not resolved all controversies this was in demoting Pluto and while many scientists have accepted the definition some in the astronomical community have rejected it outright and I think that's important to remember this locked step idea of science is almost the same as that religious resistance to, to new information albeit today we're seeing it happening happening on a very faster time scale back then it was you know 100 years after the fellow had died that a new person came up and oh this thing's not going to go away anytime soon says the church so what are we going to do we're going to lock him up we'll, we'll lock him up in house arrest for the rest of his life why because he refused to recount 
or denounced his his belief and insisted to the church that he was right that you're all a bunch of fools for believing that the earth is indeed the center of the universe and here it is mathematically look what it, it'll make sense when you just look at it we don't have time for that go away you may never speak of this again i'm paraphrasing i'm, I'm making a joke out of it but you can only imagine how that would have gone down now there is there are eight bodies eight planets eight body heavenly bodies officially categorized as planets um, now they're often further classified in several ways and there's each one of these so by composition by size by position relative to the sun by position relative to earth and uh, there's more they're also characterized by history so let's take each one of these by composition so there's either terrestrial or rocky planets or jovian or gas planets so the rocky planets as we know are mercury venus earth and mars the terrestrial planets are comprised or composed primarily of rock and metal and have relatively high densities they have slow rotation solid surfaces no rings and a few satellites the gas giants on the other hand jupiter saturn uranus and neptune the gas planet, uh, planets are composed primarily of hydrogen and helium and generally have low densities though they have rapid rotation deep atmospheres rings and lots of satellites so there's two ways of defining the planets the other one is by size let's do that one next so small planets mercury venus earth and mars these planets have diameters less than 13,000 kilometers and then we have the giant planets this is by observation jupiter saturn uranus and neptune giant planets have diameters greater than 48,000 kilometers the giant planets are sometimes also returned, referred to as gas giants and i've already done that now while this sounds like elementary physics or science that you might have learned in high school there's also another way to refer to them as inner and outer planets and i've mentioned those already so mercury venus and earth and mars are inner planets outer planets are jupiter saturn uranus and neptune but there's another thing that i haven't mentioned yet and this will become important a bit later on so with the date 1781 the discovery of uranus the asteroid belt between mars and jupiter forms a boundary between the inner solar system and the outer solar system hmm remember that one now the other one is by position relative to earth we have inferior and superior planets the inferior planets are mercury and venus now they're closer to the sun than the earth and this is all in relation to the earth the inferior planets show phases like the moon when viewed from earth these are invisible in night sky they have waxing and waning views because of the sun's reflection okay then we have the earth on its own we're the only one in our orbit that might not have been true in the past superior planets this is mars through neptune farther from the sun than the earth is one and the other one is that superior planets always appear full or nearly so they never have a waxing or a waning view they never go to a sliver because it doesn't matter where we are we only ever see them with from lit from say behind or in front fully that makes sense right okay whereas the ones on the inside of our orbit we only have, we can see them being lit from a, a portion of their side because they're closer it's it's ang it's all about angular it's all angular here okay so the last one is by history so classical planets all the ones we could see immediately with our eyes which are mercury venus mars jupiter and saturn 
Now, they're known since prehistorical times. They're visible to the unaided eye. In ancient times, this term also referred to the sun and the moon. They were also known as classical planets. The order was usually specified as Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and Moon, based on the time for them to go all the way round the sphere of the fixed stars. So, wow, okay, let, let me think about this. So the moon would go round, I think the sun would be the quickest, wouldn't it? It would go round once. So would Venus, we'd see that go around once every day. I suspect we'd see Mars doing that over a 10 year period as being slower. So would then Jupiter and then out to Saturn. Wow. That's an extraordinary way to think about it. The modern planets, though, not classical, but modern, are Uranus and Neptune, discovered in modern times, visible only with optical aids. Think about that. I'm, I'm telling you to think about these things because I, I'm going to draw a conclusion and, I, and, I'll, and I'm going to bring something else up. And I think it's very important that we remember those facts. 1781, optical aid only for Uranus and Neptune. And of course, we can't even see Pluto. It is it just can't, right? And it, it's barely, barely visible at all. Then there's the Earth, and then the AI. So the yeah, the IAU decided the classical should refer to all eight planets: Mercury through Neptune, including Earth, but not Pluto. This is contrary to historical usage, but makes some sense from the 21st century perspective. Well, that's according to the website that I was on. All right, so what I'm going to do when we come back from the break is it's a little bit more tinfoil hattish, is I suppose what you've come to expect from Shiny Side Out, which I mean in, indeed is and refers to the correct use and folding of your tinfoil hat. You must fold it leaving the shiny side out um, but of course here at shiny side out we do not we do not suggest that you use a tinfoil hat while using a, uh, a cell phone don't do that that's very bad the the shape and location of it wrapped around your head will focus any energy from your cell phone exactly where we don't want it and that's on the pineal gland probably very bad for you so i uh, don't operate any radio equipment while wearing a tinfoil hat okay it's probably if you are inclined to wear one enjoy it for what it is i tried to wear one for a while to see what it was like i didn't find that i could hear less or more of anyone's thoughts I didn't feel less or more controlled by the government or its satellites. And um, apart from that, uh, it was warm. I felt a considerable uh, increase in my body temperature because of the insulation of, of the body heat from my head. As we know, a lot of body heat is lost through your head. So... And you're right, uh, blasphemous Buddha in the chat room. The sad part is it's not tin, but aluminium. Yes, in America, you call it aluminum. Well, I know if it were tin, it might be, it might be right. Maybe that's why they changed it from tin foil to aluminium foil. Maybe you could get tin foil back in the day, but that's all gone now. We don't see that anymore. Aluminium. <laughs> ECP says try a carbon fiber motorcycle helmet well I, I don't have the money for one of those uh, if I, I would do a YouTube clip with them a comparison if you want if someone sends me one but that's pretty much it after the break which is coming up in just a couple of minutes I'm going to talk about and I've, I've mentioned what a planet is so far I'm, I've mentioned how we discover them historical i breezed over that because the historical reference wasn't about the discovery of them but i'm going to talk about that after the break and what have we found and what's yet to be found in our solar system 
And also, since it's tinfoil hat time, and the show's about Planet X, you know where I'm going. I don't need to tell you. But that's what we're going to be, I'm, well, I'm going to be covering it. Sadly, Mecky isn't with us uh, today. I'm sure he's actually in the air flying from Australia to the US right now. If only I had the opportunity to do that and go to some of the conferences that are available in the US. Oh, uh, we feel so isolated here. We'd love if, if more of those conferences were extended out to the out to Australia. It'd be much better. I certainly get a lot more opportunity to meet some of the people in the field. Uh, certainly in the paranormal field, in the in ufology, and um, get to meet more abductees. That'd be good. It's a tough world, you know. You live so far away from everybody. Um, just before the end of the break here, um, I've done an interview with James Bartley. He's got his own site, the Cosmic Switchboard. I've recently done an interview with him. That was pretty cool. I basically talked about my abductions. Uh, and you might like that if you're a fan of the show, if, if you're that way inclined, maybe if you've had your own. I wrote the book for that as my experiences that may help others either identify whether they are that's you can take that out of scope or you can see that you know there's life after those and what it helped me do was make me happy in my own skin I'm and I really don't have to think about that stuff anymore I don't have to think about it it's there but I, I can let it go and that was what I was able to do because when it's all bottled up inside ah oh, it's too much pressure on yourself so that's what I was able to do. The music will be here any second. And I'm going to ask that everyone uses the time during the break to go and hit that donate button on the website on freedomslips.com. That's freedomslips.com. If you're in the chat room and I ask you to go there during the break too and talk to me after the break, it's the donate button's there on the left. It's really easy. And you can get something in return, by the way. You can get seat packs and listen to the bumpers. You can get seat packs. You can get EMP proof thumb drives. You, there's specials. Put, put a comment in there when you do donate. I'll see you after the break. Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. UFOs to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. 
There is no denying the world is awakening. We see it in the global uprisings and demonstrations of the people around the planet and the new way of thinking and living that is arising naturally within each one of us and our communities. I have been a major player in this global shift and movement for over 20 years and have helped tens of thousands of people around the world change their lives and find their voice in order to help create the paradigm change we so desperately need. Join me here at Revolution Radio on the Just Bernard Show every Tuesday at noon Eastern time for two hours of powerful interviews and discussion with some of the most influential visionaries of consciousness, alternative media, and suppressed knowledge. We promise to reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience. Medical now, natural, and maybe even on your personal concerns. You have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is. Well, check out our preloaded EMP proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records? Addresses? Phone numbers? Well, squeeze on over to freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us, we're already here. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent news story, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. On the go? Still want to listen? Don't have one of those fancy phones with too many buttons? Don't know what an app is? Or you don't even care? Well, we got you here at Revolution Radio. Now you can dial in 24-7 to listen to our shows. We have a number for Studio A and Studio B. And best of all, it's free. Don't forget, your carrier charges for your cell phone provider may apply, though. So check with your cell provider to make sure. So ready? Here you go. Get a pen. Here's the number. Studio A is 712-432-6958. And Studio B is 716-748-0112. Thank you very much for listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station in the world. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. You're back with David You're Mickey's back. shiny side out on freedomslips.com on the number one listener supported talk radio on the net. So push the donate button or subscribe to the archives for only $5 a month. That's the cost of a cup of coffee. I'd like to say hello to all of those people, all the new listeners we have today, also the existing listeners, but I'm paying particular attention to the new ones. We are glad that you're on board and hopefully your journey will be a swift and easy journey of knowledge. That of knowledge, and that's what Mickey and I are in this for, is knowledge. We want to learn. We're halfway through, or I should say I am halfway through, show number 269. That's what the number is. 269, my goodness me. 
and this is the 7th of May 2017 269 you know when Mackie and I started we thought we'd be lucky if we lasted a year doing it but you know here we are still doing it Mackie is is not with us today he's flying he's in the air probably towards the US he said he had to go to the US this week but he and he wasn't sure whether he could do it but uh, needless to say he's probably still in the air at the time now I forgot to mention halfway through the first hour and that is you need to get yourself some great merchandise from the station's website buy a CD this is some of your options here are buying a CD of your favorite host shows for a previous season which is pretty cool you can get yourself alternatively a uh, an EMP proof thumb drive with survival documents on it or 75,000 seeds in a seed pack but if you buy that one just make sure your customs allow you to order them because uh, in Australia we can't do that we can't order seeds from overseas they have to be have grown here or grown at an authorized place outside of that you know Monsanto and Bayer come to mind GMO uh, restrictions maybe I don't know who knows but we can't bring them into our country so if you're uh, landlocked with the US you probably can take advantage of that more readily than we can but just remember follow the instructions when you're donating when you donate money because you can get something in return and you know make a choice I, I found out recently we can we can import knives but they just have to be declared which is pretty cool so I could take advantage of that as well or also anyway uh, the number to call in if you're in the USA is 347-688-2902 or you can if you have Skype add freedom screen as a contact and then call up and it should be diverted to me but we do ask that you before you call up you say hello in the chat room at least it, you can talk to us there and and say you know I'd like to come onto air do you mind and so no thanks it's or you know we'll say yes go ahead if we're tight for topics or time some of our show cycles go over five shows so it's pretty tough to you know to have the flow of the show interrupted unless you bring something off the same information or a different perspective or something like that certainly don't call up and just go on a tangent and don't touch the topic that's that's not sort of welcome but we welcome people to call in to ask us questions or discuss the topic if you live in Kentucky you can pick us up on FM that's WZZR 101.3 FM or anywhere else and I do mean anywhere even on the ISS or US naval vessels you can use an app to do that or stream it directly through you know the freedom slips website or other websites available to that and I've got a quick list here tunein.com uh, sorry tunein.com web radio central receiver mobile app freedom slips mobile app talk stream live stream finder internet-radio.com radio tuner radio ways radio online.co and we have our own app if you want a little bit more than just streaming we have all our archives as well on there so shiny side out and that's available on apple and android platforms just search for shiny side out it's as easy as that you can get the app and we can message you if we need to if something was going down or you know you can get everything in one place it's pretty cool i made that one by the way all credit goes to me <laughs> on the dave show since becky's not here i can say that politely of course okay now let's get back to the topic so before the break i mentioned how we discover stars sorry stars planets uh, what religion thought of the whole thing that it was all shut down and that they wanted to maintain that the earth was the center of the entire universe uh, that Copernicus and then Galileo uh, brought up a, a previous idea from 240 BC which was to, that to fix all the planet problems it's quite easy everything revolves around us only in in you know in reality doesn't but it, in it looks as though it does but it's not 
mathematically it was discovered that, that none of that was true, that the Earth revolved around the Sun, the Sun is the solar system in the galaxy of them. So anyway, and that brings us to today. Oh, at the, the discovery in, in, of Neptune and Uranus were done mathematically. They were discovered first by maths that their orbits seem to slow up or stretch out away from the sun uh, just a little, uh, just enough called a perturbation and that that perturbation was was discovered in because their orbit didn't seem just right it seemed a little odd and by doing that they just they said well there must be a planet further out from from there and surely there it was they calculated its position looked in that in that spot in the night sky with telescope rudimentary as it was and went hey there's a planet there they were right so discovered by maths and uranus was the first well that's not where the story ends though so since this is a tinfoil hat zone let's talk about this look it's been suggested that voyager one and two were sent out into space and this is in relation to planet x which is the real topic here the science of planet x it's been said that they were sent out with the purpose of identifying a planet planet x sent in the same direction away from earth but far enough apart to cover an arc in the sky okay which was where nasa had calculated the planet to be in 40 years time when they got there which is now launched back in the 70s they've made it far enough now to be considered in interstellar state uh, interstellar space that's a big achievement I and mean, that's really big so congrats to to nasa for achieving something that they didn't say that they were doing <laughs> they said oh, i was going to send them out there see what's out there yeah you know have some fun let's call them voyager one and two and and launch them out and it's going to be a huge cost and and even carl sagan got into this he got into it by putting a disc on there and worked with you know scientists to to work out how we could best pictorially without using language tell people of its origin and you have to think about how that works so well of course i've seen the plaque i think they did a great job uh maybe you know you'd have to be a lot smarter than oh i don't know a, a primary school child here to work it out it looks like the human has four arms and four legs that's something to be seen well, look, look at these they're not bipedal they're quadpedal gotta see those imagine if you ran into this probe you beamed it aboard your ship and it's got this plaque oh, there looks it's a four-legged four-armed person i'm gonna see that maybe that's clickbait <laughs> think about it in today's terms maybe that that plaque looks like clickbait oh i'm not gonna do that to send it on its way who wants to see that that can't be real that's pretty funny so so that's what it's been suggested is that nasa intentionally sent these two objects out there into space to attempt to find planet x i mean planet x isn't new its discovery and the history behind it isn't new i mean it's as old as the earth older in fact so when i looked this up i found that the nasa website its own website it states that and as i've got a quote here which which might make sense scientists hope to learn more about this region talking about the the heliosphere or outside the heliosphere when voyager 2 in the helio sheath the outermost layer of the of the heliosphere where the solar wind is slowed by the pressure of interstellar medium also reaches interstellar space so when it punches through the helio sheath which is the 
the point at which the sun's outward force is holding back the interstellar pressure. Now, both spacecraft are still sending scientific information about their surroundings through Deep Space Network, or the DSN. All right. If you turn your tap on at the sink, the kitchen sink, and a stream of the of the smallest stream, the continuous stream you can have coming out of that tap, where it doesn't go down the plug hole immediately. But instead, if you can you can represent this helio sheath or heliosphere by allowing the finest stream for your sink tap to hit the bottom of the sink and form an like an outward disc, an outward pressure disc, it, it'll only measure a small distance outwards its outward pressure is stopping the inward force of the water in the sink where you've left the plug out and visibly there's a disc and a pressure built up around the outside where the water is trying to come back in but it's holding it out there yes i said plug hole nothing else all right it's easy p now the water of the sink is is draining down the, down the plug hole, down the plug, down the hole, down the sink hole, and that is visible. And now that visible disc is what we call the heliosphere in, in the solar system, and the outward pressure is caused by the sun. So that's an interesting thing that science are, are talking about us going like we we want to know more about what's out there. Okay, but what, what are they doing today? So Caltech researchers. The researchers at Caltech have found evidence suggesting there may be a planet X deep in the solar system. And they said not really in the solar system deep, it's at the outside part of it. Deep outside, the, and that's not even right, is it? Deep outside the solar system. At the very furthest edges of our solar system would be better. This hypothetical Neptune-sized planet orbits our sun in a highly elongated orbit far beyond Pluto, it says on the website. This is at solarsystem.nasa.gov forward slash planets forward slash planet X. They got a website for planet X, NASA. So they deny it all the time. And then when you look at the website, oh, there it is, it says there. So they've got a part of the website, surely one of their projects has been out there looking for it. Okay, the continuation of this says the possibility of a new planet is certainly an exciting one for me, this is a quote from their website, as a planetary scientist and for all of us, said Jim Green, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division. This is not, however, the detection or discovery of a new planet. It's too early to say with certainty. There's a so-called Planet X. What we're seeing is an early prediction based on modeling from limited observations. It's the start of a process that could lead to an exciting result. That means he wants to continue funding for this project without calling it too soon. Although I have to say that a mystery heavenly body has been discovered and as a quote from a, a news story and I forget the date of it oh my goodness me but there's been a continuous stream of stories over the years in the last 30 years all declaring the discovery of planet X they keep coming stories just keep appearing every once in a while in the paper every couple of years there's a new story we found planet x and then silence hmm i wonder why that is what is it what is it about planet x that either you know wants makes them want to put out the story and then pull it or silence did they find it have they found it again is there a new group of people finding it this time and declaring it? Is it always NASA? Is it not NASA? What is it about the properties of such a planet that might make it important to find it? 
Now, as we led into 2012, we had a lot of people talking about heavy mass objects, about uh, intruders into the sol into our solar system, second suns, the devastation that has occurred, possibly to occur again, this path of planet X and where it's going to come, what it's going to do, is it going to impact with Earth? All of those topics came up. And it was just, it was Planet X revisited. It was really what it was all about. I remember hearing the YouTube clip, one of them, you know, the hundreds of an interview with a, well, it sounded like an ex NASA employee. I think that was the way it was described. And that it was at the time through the, the Hubble, it was like looking, this is a quote from, I think, the, uh, the uh, interview, it was like looking across the street at it and that it was a, a large, a large fiery red ball with red plumes coming off the side and lots of iron oxide. I remember all of these stories and it was actually, to be honest, it was one of the reasons why I ended up listening to Revolution Radio. It's what one of the things that fell and that I fell into the story of and then subsequently listened to Revolution Radio on a regular basis. I listen to a lot of news, a lot of outlets, have a very large, broad range of information that comes in towards me and what I discern from that is up to me and you, you do your best to try and find either the origin of the story or you try best to find any anything any truth in it uh, how are the slants being presented to you because there might be agendas and so if you, there is an agenda can you see through the agenda into what the real information is whether it's a snippet of the full story or this you know or the story is entirely slant based where they've just got a a whole uh, you know, there's an agenda maybe from the organization to propagate a certain mindset whatever those happen to be. And so Mackie and I, when we got together and decided to do this thing, one of those things was we were going to bring you the information that as it see, as you see it, and then we can put our comments around the outside. So we're not, we, we obviously, you know, by now how we think, uh, we know what a, a, the majority of you guys think about these topics. So it's good to bring this information out. Now, at the moment, they're talking about either a Neptune or Uranus-sized object, that Planet 9 would be, say, 10 Earths big. Uh, Neptune and Uranus are like 17 and 14 and a half times big -er than the Earth, or as big, or multiples of the Earth's mass. So... They're also talking about the length of years uh, in its orbit that might be 10,000 or greater years in, a, in an orbit. The orbital diagram that I, I remember seeing Sitchin in a video, in a black and white video with a NASA scientist talking about a highly elliptical orbit that brought its, its path into where the asteroid belt is from way, way outside maybe three times the distance of Pluto away every 3,600 years was the description of the planet X Nibiru. It was named, and I'll get to that in a minute. Now, any planet coming into our solar system, of course, with its gravity, would have subsequent, subsequent effects on those orbits of all the existing planets. We know even the slightest the slightest effect of a planet in another orbit, like let's call them shells, like atoms, another shell around the sun will cause perturbations on inner planets that have an effect, a slowing down of that planet's orbit or a slight stretching out towards that other planet. So they, if they can do that, then a planet that comes through our entire solar system into nearly the middle 
close to the sun and flicks back out again would do all the things that the interview suggested. So scientifically, if that were the case, it could also explain why we all have our ellipses as orbits and all of our orbits are slightly attempting to recover in the absence of this planet and on its return it negatively impacts their their the perfect nature of their orbits and insists again on each orbit the relative amount of disturbance again causing more or less elliptical orbits i hope that it makes sense to everybody yes the science is real about the introduction of a planet coming through our solar system the science is real on when you look at it now that the only planet that has a nearly perfect orbit is mercury the rest don't have a nearly perfect orbit in fact they're all ellipses uh, and we know this on earth because the earth is closer to the sun during the australian summer than it is to the american summer that makes sense so our summer is hotter but slightly it only needs to be slightly to to say it's hotter okay so so i've said i've said so far about and i've just briefly mentioned the asteroid belt and nibiru so so let's think about this what does history say about about the earth and about the earth's creation and about the other the other planets in the solar system and what does it say about the asteroid belt so what does science say we were all on i think it's called an accretion disk and as clumps of stuff decided to clump together that caused irregularities in the a, a consistent gravitational force around the ecliptic of the sun and that accretion disk slowly got eaten up by the clumps creating larger clumps and then bodies and those began a natural rotation based on yeah, basically the distance from the sun and the gravitational forces on an object that would be still and if it began to rotate and it got large enough it would cause a, a spherical shape to occur because everything would be pulled uniformly towards the middle there you go enough crushing force would cause a liquid center uh, through you know material be crushed when it when it's not a gas giant it's a celestial body containing iron and rock so that seems to make total sense that there's an accretion disk however the accretion disk doesn't it doesn't allow for the creation of the asteroid belt the asteroid belt in itself seems to go against the accretion disk theory and can't be explained aha uh -huh. see now we fall into the period of Suma historically looking back at their test their texts it seems to make a lot more sense now the text that I'm going to we just browse over uh, briefly browse over here is uh, it was Sanskrit text it's been translated and many different translations of it uh, NASA including Sitchin so uh, there are descriptions and I, I have to say NASA have adopted a lot of the information or claim to have come up with the information themselves which matches that of the Sumerian text but just to cover it off real briefly here okay how the asteroid belt and the earth and everything our solar system's creation has been said to have been affected by nibiru ancient texts mention another planet these are the sumerians the sumerians state very clearly in their text that a heavenly body 
called Nibiru, flew into our solar system. And its moon collided with Tiamat. T R Mart. And guess what that was? That was the Earth. Now this was the that was the Earth's name prior to the impact. Tiamat. The impact created the asteroid belt, and the impact site is the Pacific Basin of the Earth. So the Earth would have been much larger. It would have been the Earth and a lot of the mass of the asteroid belt. It's actually enough mass there to make a whole other planet. But if you crumpled all that together again, and then minus the, the moon of Nibiru that slammed into Tiamat, possibly, possibly, then there you, there you have it. You have, you have an Earth, and the Earth reduced its orbit due to the impact and sped up its orbit because of the impact. The Earth's misshapen, so if you drained all the water away, the, there's a very strange flat or flattened sphere compressed into the Earth as the Pacific Basin that, that very, very little is known or has been spoken about it in scientific, the scientific realm. But the age, I'd love to know the comparison age from someone who was telling the truth between the Pacific Basin floor going down, you know, maybe if it was at all possible, a couple of miles into the Earth uh, surface below the silt and that same distance down on the other parts of the Earth. It's also been stated that this collision uh, brought a lot of water to the Earth and that the um, and NASA also state that they believe the moon was created as a part of that uh, collision, but I, I really highly doubt that. I've got a problem with that. I, I just don't know why. It's almost like it's grating against me and I, it's like a dark matter. I don't believe any of that is real either, but for some reason I've always understood the speed of light and, and, and anyway, there's a lot more to that. So moving back to Nibiru, the most important reason that I've held on to which was to not dismiss the Sumerian stories about this collision with Tiamat is that they were scientifically provable. You can model it. It seems to be what happened. And the fact that NASA have jumped on board saying, oh yeah, the Earth was uh, collided with by another body a long time ago, like they call it the proto-Earth at the time. A proto-Earth was collided with another object. Now, for instance, how, how else can we scientifically prove any of the information that the Sumerians contain within their stories? Well, let's look at the origin of those stories. The stories themselves are said to have been handed to them by the Anunnaki. So who are the Anunnaki? The Anunnaki are those from heaven, those, from, those who from heaven came is the loose translation of the word Anunnaki. Now, they not only describe the impact with Earth, however, they also suggest that Uranus lie on its side. Hang on, so, so when was this? Oh, I don't know, 3,600 years ago plus or minus a hundred thousand. It's been said some of the Sumerian stories go back as far as 125,000 years ago. Uh, we don't know. We're told at the moment it's around about 3,600 years ago. So that's why everyone was expecting Nibiru to return any minute. But let's just say it was 3,600 years ago. For, for whatever reason, it's, it's actually irrelevant if it's any older than that. But I'll, I'll sit with 3,600 years for the minute. Now, 
if we didn't discover Uranus until 1781, how come they're talking about a planet that was lying on its side and spinning? How could they describe um, Neptune as being blue? Both of these are blue, greeny, planetoidy kind of things. Their color comes from one from ammonia that's in the air on the planet. It's going to be gas giants, but they're big, but they're certainly rocky. Got a lot of gas around the outside, so do a lot of things. And I suppose even Jupiter and Saturn have rocky cores. There's, you know, at least an Earth sized thing inside it, if not bigger. So that's that's weird isn't it that the sumerians have written down unchanged text unchanged from the moment that they wrote it out that states clearly that there is a planet who's rotating on its side and it's past the ones we can see in fact i mean they list all the planets they have their own names for them but how how could they know that how could they know it rotated on its side? We can't even see it. So they're writing down a text about a planet they cannot see, but only because these people told them about them. The Anunnaki. Spacefaring people that arrived to Earth clearly after the collision and have revisited ever since. That's what it says. So, 1781, huh? Wait a minute, this makes sense. How can they know about it? Anyway, they said the Anunnaki had taught them all about all of the other planets as well. In fact, if they've got a cylinder seal, like which, which is a basically a cylinder you roll and it's been carved in such a way. So when you roll it along a length of clay, it's like printing. You can print out hundreds of these things and hand them out. What they would do is they'd, they'd roll it in clay and then fire it so it becomes permanent. And then they'd hand those out. as like pages or information pages. So, <laughs> say for don't start talking about flat. I don't want to hear anything about flat. If every single thing in the, in the whole universe, all the other planets around spherical objects spherical there would be no sense at all to suggest that our earth is flat and i'm not going there okay um so rd47 says two years ago no flat earthers now a hundred thousand homemade flat earth videos estimated 200 million flat earths flat earthers now exist worldwide well, I'll tell you, 40 years ago, actually 30 years ago, I met a Flat Earth Society member. It's a society of people who have joined, let's just call it a secret society for intents and purposes, who believe primarily on the outer face of their society, believe that the Earth is flat. I think the earth is flat from a different perspective, not physical, but from our societal behavior. I believe the earth is flat now, now more than ever. But I don't believe it from a physics standpoint, doesn't make any sense, none of it proves to be correct. It certainly isn't flat. If I can show you maths for about five minutes, it isn't, it isn't flat at all. It's spherical, I'm sorry to say. If you believe it, that's, that's your bag and I don't really care. I don't care that you believe that. People believe all sorts of things and I'll never try to sway you from your belief. I always present, Mackie and I do the same thing, we present information and if you wish to change your perspective, we're not selling it to you, but if you choose to change your you know, opinion, that's up to you. We'll never hold it against you. We don't actually care whether you believe it or not. We don't care that people believe in the flat earth. We don't care that people don't believe it. It doesn't make any difference to anyone at all. All right, simple as that. 
So I'm not going down that path again. We have a whole show on the Flat Earth where we take every one of the points of view that they say scientifically proves it exists and we prove that it doesn't exist using their methods, not our methods. So good luck. But uh, long live the flat earthers, I say. Good for you. I don't really mind. Now, so, so the Sumerians, facts are real. The facts are provable. Except, of course, we can't tell, we can't prove that Tiamat was really the name of the earth before the collision. We can't believe, believe that we can't prove that Nibiru itself was a planet. It could be a, the name of like the starship Enterprise. The Anunnaki could be the people that lived around in this solar system. They could be from somewhere else. That isn't known. Just that they did visit, they passed this information down, and they've said that they'll return. So did the Norse god say that he would return the stories the further stories about the sumerians and the anunnaki the relationship there that humans were were created by the anunnaki that actually makes sense because our chromosome count of 46 chromosomes pairs or the pairs um, is different from the other bipedal species of the other hominids that were around before us are 48 chromosomes. So why, why would that occur? And there is no scientific evidence to suggest that that can occur through an evolution of a species. That if we would, you can't change chromosome count. They don't change chromosome count. There isn't a chromosome count change in any other life form that's evolved from its past ancestors so it's Lloyd Pye interview is pretty solid on that Lloyd Pye researched the the DNA history of hominids and that's what he told us he told that very story to us he also said that all of the the cheetahs in the world are all the same they have dog and cat DNA joined together weirdly joined together he said in fact it looked like it was a it was a combination of those two creatures because it has dog and cat fur that doesn't make sense it's the only one of the big cats that has that in fact all of the every single last one of them has exactly the same dna not like humans have you know that was called the human dna no, ours aren't all the same. And in fact, you know, you could have twins who you can't transplant an organ between the two of them because it's going to reject in the other person. I'm not saying identical twins. I mean, you know, two children born of the same mother from different embryos at the same time, of course. They're not compatible. We're not the same. We're just not the same. We have different blood types. None of this is, would make sense. We just accept it as being the rule. But when you look at other, one, this creature in particular, it has the same DNA. It has a small litter, and those who don't have the same DNA apparently um, self terminate. But those who do continue to live. It's a perfect system of being able to create the same creature over and over again. I suspect that at some point, when we're playing that role of creating a species whatever we want to have that we would do a very similar thing we wanted to replicate but only replicate exactly the same we don't want it to change that's the creature we wanted it's like an error code in computing when you send the message you want the message to get there the way you sent it not changed on the way through we don't want it to have been changed well, Diet Joke has sent me a, a link here, and I'm going to have to look at this. This is to do with chromosome changes. This is the kind of interactive radio that we really love. All right. 
Okay, so changes in chromosome number. In genetics as a whole, there are a few topics that impinge upon human affairs quite so directly as this one. Foremost is the fact that a large proportion of genetically determined ill health in humans is caused by abnormal chromosome numbers. True. Additionally, manipulation of chromosome number is routinely used in by breeders to improve agriculturally important species. Absolutely. And it talks, though, I've just, it's difficult to do this while I'm on air, but I'll, I'll certainly take the rest of it on notice and get back to you in the next show. It's an interesting article. Let me keep reading real quick. Yeah. Make it make your point. If you've read it, diet joke, um, let me know what the what it actually says. So I can read that out. Um so the main the main issue here is that the Sumerians handed down a whole bunch of whole bunch. Let's say that just a whole bunch. And on Earth the immediate pop-up civilization like a pop-up store before them there was no from what we've understand so far in the current historical model there was no you know science politics police health agriculture and cities and writing language before the sumerians appeared there was none of that suddenly poof there you go you have no evolution of building construction no evolution of societal behavior nothing suddenly there's a town and it's fully fledged town with civilization like the romans and they have a full history and the history is all extraterrestrial history now this doesn't to me sound like the kind of thing that nasa wants to get out there they don't want to tell us that you know what we were created by the anunnaki that the word adam in your religious text if you're religious and you have a, a bible next to you every time you see the word god it wasn't god it's been changed the sumerian story this their texts are unchanged they're the original text they haven't been translated into you know 20 languages and back again and you know things omitted because it didn't seem politically viable or there'd be you know destruction of society there was no brookings report on it but the church decided to filter most of the information clean out what they didn't want this is what we want to say and here we go and that's the bible I'm not saying it's wrong don't get me wrong but what i'm doing is comparing it to the sumerian texts and the sumerian text now by historians is the closest record that we've got to the original text it says this is the only one that's remained unchanged everything else appears to have come from it and i'm just reiterating their point of view theologians are saying the same thing they're going oh my goodness this is like it's exactly the same all the stories are the same adam and eve adam is it's actually a sumerian word for first man adamu adamu is their word for the first human that was created by the anunnaki and how do they do it they did it by dna now they said he was created from Adam, from his rib. Adam's ribs. Very funny. It's a joke from MASH. However, think about that. How would we do it today? Take a bit of bone marrow. Bingo. DNA. Safe fight, I'll check that video out. Thank you very much. So, wait, but wait a minute. How can they be right? But we've got science. We have science to back us up. We have science to back us up in the discovery of planets. 
We have science to back us up. We have maths. But our history doesn't match that of the Sumerians. It doesn't seem to match it. It's also a language that doesn't originate from other languages. It's a pop-up language. It doesn't have any other origins. There's only, I think, two other languages. We did a, we did the entomology of, of language and we found, I think there was three of these isolates, they're called. And those isolates were languages that just appeared uh, out of thin air with no other origin. You're, normally a trade route will distort your language because of introductions of words from other peoples. Uh, we know that some of the the languages will can you know maybe the people who had the most money their language will be in that currency for instance the language will include that currency as a trading currency so the, the the counting numbers will be those they say that the arabic we have arabic numbers we don't actually i mean there's only one that looks like a three and it's back to front we don't actually have arabic numbering we have the use of zero but we don't have Arabic numbering. If you, if you believe that I'm wrong, go ahead and, and message me and certainly put comments below in the in the YouTube archive and I'll, I'll get back to you. I, I do respond to each one of them. Um, but that's, but this is the point. So we believed it when it was our people discovering planets by maths. Yeah, we believed that. We believed it back in 1781 we believed that we discovered a brand new planet. No, we just rediscovered it. The Sumerians knew all about it. They already knew 3,600 years ago, at a minimum. Now the Sumerians also, the, uh, sorry, the, the, in Africa, there is evidence of mining, gold mining, that appears to be well older than, you know, 3,600 years, 12,000 years, 100,000 years. There's stories of uh, creating foundations for a building and breaking into a, uh, you know, a fully lined underground tunnel that wasn't on any map and it certainly wasn't made by anyone that anyone can remember. There, is, there are tales of that also in South America as well, where they stumble upon uh, a tunnel system underground which was pre-existing in north america there was a uh, the construction of a road through a hillside and the hillside uh, they cut through the hillside and it, in the cutting area they broke into an underground cave which was filled with artifacts and when they came back the next day everything had been removed and the whole site had been sealed up not sure who did that, don't know if it was a three-letter agency or it was somewhere else, but whatever they found, the workers found, that was the end of that. <laughs> so it's these kind of finds that change your perspective. They change my perspective and I'm able to change my, my perspective on what we see around us as new information comes in. Because when I was born, I believed everything was the way the school told me, but I had my doubts. And it wasn't until, uh, until you learn more, until, you know, Van Donigan, Van Donigan's book came out, you know, um, Chariots of the Gods, they start to question it. And from then on, I was hooked, line and sinker in a copy of Angling Times, pulled into the outside world, outside of the education system and fully believes it's just like the religious system from way back in the 1400s. Science doesn't want to change its perspective, although it's forcefully having to understand that Americans have, and proof of this we mentioned last week, has been found that in North America humans existed there more than 100,000 years ago due to fossil finds and that humans probably ate the, the mammoths to extinction. They probably tasted delicious. Probably. In New Zealand, we know that the people of New Zealand only inhabited that island around 700 years ago from today. 
before then there was a beautifully uh, flightless bird wandering all over the, the place which was apparently delicious because <laughs> they ate them all and they were particularly stupid and uh, trusting of humans with clubs you could just bat it over the head and then pop it on the fire delicious anyway we'll see you next week for 270 the show number 270 Mackie should be back on board with us next coming up is a round table with Jer Bear so if you feel inclined and you're awake and you've had too much coffee call into the station 347-688-2902 in about 10 minutes time take care everyone Thank mm -hmm. you.